Dear colleagues, thank you for attending my presentation and welcome to the Psychiatry and Mental Health um, Conference 2019 um, in uh, Dubai. Today I would like to discuss the confluence between narcissism, pathological narcissism and depression. Narcissists mourn the loss of narcissistic supply, attention. They grieve over vanished sources of supply. They bemoan the injustice and discrimination that they suffer at the hands of people they perceive as inferior. Narcissists are often in a bad mood, unhedonic, dysphoric, and outright depressed. The narcissist's mood swings are self-destructive and self-defeating. Finally, at the end of my presentation, I will compare pathological narcissism with the manic phase of bipolar 1 disorder. Some scholars consider pathological narcissism to be indeed a form of depressive illness. And this is the position of the authoritative magazine Psychology Today, for example. The life of the typical narcissist is indeed punctuated with recurrent bouts of dysphoria, ubiquitous sadness and hopelessness, of anhedonia, loss of the ability to feel pleasure, and of clinical forms of depression, cyclothemic, dysthemic, or other. But this picture is obfuscated by the comorbidity of mood disorders with pathological narcissism. And so we will have to tread lightly and subtly here. While the distinction between reactive exogenous and endogenous depression is obsolete, it is still, in my view, useful in the context of pathological narcissism. And that's because narcissists react with depression, not only to life crisis, but also to fluctuations in narcissistic supply, in attention. And they also react with depression to a circumstantial inability to express their dominant psychosexual type, cerebral or somatic. The narcissist's personality is disorganized. We all know that. It is precariously balanced. The narcissist regulates his sense of self-worth, not from within his ego, but from the outside by consuming narcissistic supply from other people. Any threat to the uninterrupted flow of attention of this supply compromises the narcissist's psychological integrity and his ability to function. It is perceived by the narcissist actually as life-threatening. Indeed, depression can be conceptualized as a reaction to the systemic failure of hitherto trustworthy and efficacious coping strategies, either owing to a seismic change in circumstances and the environment or because of overwhelming new information. So let's start with the first type of depression, loss-induced dysphoria. This is the narcissist's depressive reaction to the loss of one or more sources of narcissistic supply, sources of attention, or to the disintegration of a pathological narcissistic space, his stalking or hunting grounds, the social unit whose members lavish him with praise and adulation and admiration. Another type of dysphoria is the deficiency-induced dysphoria. This is a deep and acute depression which follows the aforementioned loss, the loss of supply or uh, psychological or, or pathological narcissistic space. Having mourned these losses, the narcissist now grieves their inevitable outcome, the absence or deficiency of narcissistic supply. Paradoxically, this dysphoria energizes the narcissist and moves him to find new sources of supply to replenish his dilapidated stock. And this, this depression is the one that initiates what I call the narcissistic cycle. Then there is the self-worth dysregulation dysphoria. The narcissist reacts with depression to criticism or disagreement, especially from a trusted and long-term source of narcissistic supply. He fears the imminent loss of the source and the damage to his own fragile mental balance. The narcissist also resents his, his own vulnerability and his extreme dependence on feedback from others. And all these put together create a depressive reaction, which is therefore a kind of mutation of self-directed aggression. Then there is the grandiosity gap dysphoria. The narcissist firmly, though counterfactually, perceives himself as omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, brilliant, accomplished, perfect, irresistible, immune, and invincible. This is the grandiosity construct. Any data to the contrary is usually filtered, altered, or discarded altogether in an extreme form 
of confirmation bias or Dunning-Kruger effect. Still, sometimes reality intrudes, and then there's a grandiosity gap. The narcissist is forced to face his own mortality, limitations, ignorance, and relative inferiority. He sulks. He sinks into an incapacitating, but short-lived dysphoria. And finally, there's a self-punishing dysphoria. Deep inside, the narcissist hates and loathes himself. He doubts his own self-worth. That's why he needs input from the outside. He deplores his desperate addiction to narcissistic supply. The narcissist judges his actions and intentions harshly and sadistically via um, an inner critic or a superego that is out of control. The narcissist may be unaware of these dynamics, but they are at the heart of the narcissistic disorder, and the reason the narcissist has to resort to narcissism is a defense mechanism in the first place. This inexhaustible well of ill, wish, ill will, self-chastisement, self-doubt, and self-directed aggression and hatred, this yields yield numerous self-defeating and self-destructive behaviors from reckless driving and substance abuse, promiscuity, civilization, constant depression, and so on and so forth. In this sense, narcissism, pathological narcissism, very much resembles borderline defenses. And indeed, when we diagnose borderline personality disorder, we put an emphasis on the narcissistic dimension. It is the narcissist's ability to confabulate, actually, that saves him from himself. His grandiose fantasies remove him from reality and prevent recurrent narcissistic injuries. Many narcissists end up being delusional, uh, schizoid or paranoid. To avoid agonizing and gnawing depression, they give up on life and the world itself. One therapeutic technique would be anchoring, reorienting the narcissist towards self-supply. Rather than resort to fecal and ephemeral external sources of narcissistic supply, the narcissist is taught and encouraged to resort to himself for the same good, to look forward with excited anticipation to the structured pursuit of hobbies, vocations, trades, skills, and reward-eliciting behaviors. And this approach leverages the narcissist's grandiose solipsism and fantasy of omnipotence to render the narcissist emotionally self-sufficient, in effect. There is no necessary connection between these two clinical condi conditions, depressive illness and pathological narcissism. In other words, there is no proven high correlation uh, between narcissistic personality disorder, or even a milder form of narcissism, and enduring bouts of depression or major depressive episodes. Depression is a form of aggression. Transformed, this aggression is directed at the depressed person rather than at his environment. This regime of repressed and mutated aggression is characteristics of both narcissism and depression, and that's why sometimes the confluence. Indeed, narcissism is sometimes described as a form of low-intensity depression, as I mentioned. Originally, the narcissist experiences forbidden thoughts and urges, sometimes to the point of an obsession or intrusive thoughts. His mind is full of uh, this kind of mutations of aggression, uh, curses, remnants of magical thinking, um, denigrating and malicious celebrations concerned with authority figures, current and former, parents, teachers, bosses. And all these Poisonous and, and, and this to poisonous and toxic brew, it's all proscribed by the superego or the conscience. It's forbidden. And this is doubly true if the individual possesses a sadistic, capricious superego, a result of the wrong kind of parenting by narcissistic parents. These thoughts, these wishes, do not fully surface. As Freud observed, they are repressed. The individual is only aware of them in passing, and vaguely. But they are sufficient to provoke intense guilt feelings and to set in motion a chain of self-flagellation and self-punishment. Amplified by, a, by an abnormally strict sadistic and punitive conscience or superego, this kind of celebrations result in a constant feeling of an imminent, innate threat. This is what we call anxiety. It has no discernible external triggers and therefore it is not fear. It is the echo of a battle between one part of the personality, uh, which viciously wishes to destroy the individual through excessive punishment, and his or her instinct for self-preservation and survival. Anxiety is not, is not, and as some scholars have it, 
is, it's not necessarily an irrational reaction to internal dynamics involving imaginary threats. Actually, anxiety is more rational than many uh, fears. The powers unleashed by the uh, by in inner constructs, such as the superego, are so enormous. The intentions are so lethal. The self loathing and self degradation that it brings with it are so intense that I consider the threat to be very real. Overly strict superegos are usually coupled with weaknesses and vulnerabilities in all other dimensions of the personality. Thus, there is no psychological structure which, which is capable of fighting back, of taking the side of the depressed person. Small, it is small wonder that depressives have constant suicidal ideation. They toy with ideas of self-mutilation and suicide, or worse, they commit suicide in order to avoid this inescapable battle. Confronted with such a horrible internal enemy, lacking in defenses, falling apart at the seams, depleted by previous attacks, devoid of energy of life, depressed people wish to die. Their anxiety is about survival, the alternatives being usually self-torment and self-annihilation. Depression is how this kind of patient experiences his overflowing reservoir of aggression. He is a volcano which is about to erupt and bury him under his own ashes. Anxiety is how he experiences the war raging inside him, his inner conflict. Sadness is a name that he assigns to the resulting weariness, to the knowledge that the battle is lost and personal doom is at hand, disintegration, decompensation, and acting out. Depression is the acknowledgement by the depressed individual that something is so fundamentally wrong, there is no way he can win. The individual is depressed because he is fatalistic. As long as he believes that there is a chance, however slim, to better his position, he moves in and out of depressive episodes. True, anxiety disorders and depression, mood disorders, do not belong in the same diagnostic category, but they are very often comorbid. In many cases, the patient tries to exercise his depressive demons by adopting ever more bizarre rituals, so obsessive compulsion, uh, obsession compulsion uh, kicks in. These are the compulsions which, by delivering energy and diverting energy and attention away from the bad content, uh, is more or less symbolic or ritualistic, and uh, arbitrary. These compulsions bring temporary relief and an easing of the anxiety. It is very common to meet all four, a mood disorder, an anxiety disorder, an obsessive compulsive disorder, and a personality disorder, in one patient, as all of us know. Depression is the most varied of all personal illnesses. It, is, it's, it assumes myriad guises and disguises. Many people are chronically depressed without even knowing it, and without discernible um, corresponding cognitive or affective content. Some depressive episodes are part of a cycle of ups and downs, like in bipolar disorder, or in a milder form in cyclotinic disorder, or in narcissism. Other forms of depression are built into the characters and personalities of the patients. For example, dysthymic disorder, or what used to be known as depressive neurosis. One type of depression is even seasonal and can be cured by phototherapy, gradual exposure to carefully timed artificial lighting. So, the numerous forms. We all experience adjustment disorders with depressed mood. Used to be called reactive depression, which occurs after a stressful life event or as a direct and time limited reaction to it. These poisoned garden varieties are all pervasive. Not a single aspect of the human condition escapes them. Not one element of human behavior avoids their creep. It is not wise and has no predictive or explanatory value to differentiate good or normal classes of depression from pathological ones. They are not good depressions. <laughs> whether provoked by misfortune or endogenously from the inside, whether during childhood or later in life, all depressions are one and the same. A depression is a depression is a depression, no matter what its precipitating causes are or which stage in life it occurs. The only valid distinction seems to be phenomenological. Some depressive patients slow down, psychomotor, retardation, the appetite, the sex life, libido, and, and sleep, and all of them alter. And this is known as kind of vegetative function disorder. All of them are notably perturbed. Behavior patterns change or disappear altogether. And these patients feel dead. They are unhedonic. They find pleasure and excitement in nothing. And they're also dysphoric, they're sad. The other type of depress the depressive or depressive person is psychomotorically active and at times hyperactive. 
These are the patients that I described above. They report overwhelming guilt feelings, anxiety, even to the point of having delusions, delusional thinking, not grounded in reality, but in a thwarted logic of our outlandish world. The most severe cases, and severity is also manifested physiologically in the worsening of the above-mentioned symptoms, the most severe cases exhibit paranoia to secretary delusions involving them in a in systemic, uh, systematic conspiracies. They, are, they seriously entertain ideas of self-destruction and the destruction of others. These are nihilistic delusions. They hallucinate. Their hallucinations reveal their hidden content, self-deprecation, the need to be punished, humiliated, bad or cruel or permissive thoughts about authority figures, and so on. So depressive, depressives are almost never psychotic. Psychotic depression does not belong to this family, in my view. Depression does not necessarily entail a marked change in mood. Must depression is therefore difficult to diagnose if we stick to the strict definition of depression as a mood disorder. Depression can happen at any age. It can happen to anyone, with or without a preceding stressor, stressful event. Its onset can be gradual. Its onset can be dr dramatic. The earlier in life depression occurs, the more likely it is to recur. And this apparently arbitrary and shifting nature of depression only enhances the guilt feelings of the patient. He refuses to accept that the source of his problems is beyond his control, at least as far as his aggression is concerned. Uh, he, he doesn't know about biochemic, uh, biochemical you know, neurotransmitters or genetic factors. The depressive patient blames himself or events in his immediate past of his environment. And this is a vicious and self-fulfilling prophetic cycle. The depressive feels worthless, doubts his future and his abilities, feels guilty. This constant brooding alienates his nearest and dearest, of course, and his interpersonal relationships become dysfunctional. And this, in turn, exacerbates his depression, and so on and so forth. The patient finally finds it most convenient and rewarding to avoid social interactions altogether, to go schizoid. He resigns from his job, shies away from social occasions, sexually abstains, and shuts out his few remaining friends and family members. Hostility, avoidance, histrionics all emerge, and the existence of personality disorders only makes matters worse. Freud said that the depressive person has lost a love object, was deprived of a properly functioning parent. The psychic trauma suffered early on can be alleviated only by inflicting self-punishment, thus implicitly penalizing and devaluing the internalized version of the disappointing love object. The development of the ego, said Freud, is con conditioned upon a successful resolution of the loss of the love objects, a phase all of us have to go through. When the love object fails, the child is furious, revengeful, and aggressive. Unable to direct these negative emotions at a frustrating parent, the child directs them at himself instead. It's a proto prototype of depression. Narcissistic identification means that the child prefers to love himself, direct his libido at himself, than to love an unpredictable, abandoning parent, mother in most cases. Thus, the child becomes his own parent and directs his aggression at himself, at the parent that he had become. Throughout this wrenching process, the ego feels helpless, and this is another major source of depression. When depressed, the patient becomes an artist of sorts. He tars his life, people around him, his experiences, places and memories, with a thick brush of schmaltzy, sentimental, and nostalgic longing. The depressive imbues everything with sadness, a tune, a sight, a color, another person, a situation, or a memory. He's triggered, and in this sense, depression is a kind of post-traumatic condition. The depressive is cognitively distorted. He interprets his experiences, evaluates himself, and assesses the future totally, catastrophically, and negatively. He behaves as though constantly disenchanted, disillusioned, and hurting, a dysphoric effect. And this helps to sustain the distorted perceptions. No success, no accomplishment, no support can break through this cycle because it is so self-contained and so self-sustaining and self-enhancing. Dysphoric effect supports distorted perceptions which enhance dysphoria, which encourages self-defeating behaviors, which brings about failure, and which justifies depression, of course. And this is a cozy little circle charmed and emotionally protective because it is unfailingly predictable. Depression is addictive because it is a strong love substitute. Much like drugs, it has its own rituals, language, and worldview. It imposes rigid order and behavior patterns on the depressive. And this is learned helplessness. 
the depressive prefers to avoid even situations which hold the promise of improvement in his, to his harrowing condition. The depressive patient has been conditioned by repeated aversive stimuli to freeze in his tracks. He doesn't even possess the requisite energy to end his cruel predicament by committing suicide. The depressive is devoid of the positive reinforcements, which are the building blocks of our self-esteem. He is filled with negative thinking about himself, about his goals, or lack of them, about his lack of achievements, his emptiness, his loneliness, and so on and so forth. And because his cognition and perceptions are deformed, no cognitive or rational input can alter the situation. Everything is immediately reinterpreted to fit the paradigm. People often mistake depression for emotion. They say about the narcissist, but he is sad. And they mean, but he is human, but he has emotions. And this is wrong. It's true that depression is a big component in the narcissist's emotional makeup, but it mostly has to do with the absence of narcissistic supply. It mostly has to do with uh, nostalgia for more plentiful days, full of adoration and attention and applause. It mostly occurs after the narcissist has depleted his secondary source of narcissistic supply, his spouse, his mate, girlfriend, colleagues, with his constant demands for the reenactment of his days of glory. Some narcissists even cry, but they cry exclusively for themselves and for, for the lost paradise. They do so conspicuously, ostentatiously, and publicly in order to reignite the narcissistic cycle, in order to attract attention, in effect. The narcissist is a human pendulum hanging by the thread of the void that is his false self. He swings from brutal and vicious abrasiveness to mellifluous modeling and saccharine sentimentality. It is all a simulacrum, a very similitude, a facsimile or a confabulation, enough to fool the casual observer, enough to extract the narcissist's drug, other people's attention, the reflection that somehow sustains his house of cards. But the stronger and more rigid the defenses, and nothing is more resilient than pathological narcissism, believe me, the stronger the defenses, the greater and deeper the hurt the narcissist aims to counteract or compensate for. Once narcissism stands in direct reaction to the seething abyss and devouring vacuum that one harbors in one's true self. Perhaps narcissism is indeed, as many people say, a reversible choice, but it is also a rational choice, guaranteeing self-preservation and survival. It's, a, it's an adaptation. The paradox is that being a self-loathing narcissist may be the only act of true self-love that the narcissist ever commits. Now let us study a specific mood disorder and compare it to narcissism. Bipolar 1 disorder. The manic phase is often misdiagnosed as narcissistic personality disorder. Bipolar parent, uh, patients in the manic phase exhibit many of the signs and symptoms of pathological narcissism, hyperactivity, self-centeredness, lack of empathy, and control freakery. During this recurring chapter of the disease, the patient is euphoric, has grandiose fantasies, spins unrealistic schemes, and has frequent rage attacks, is irritable, if her or his wishes and plans are inevitably frustrated. The manic phases, the manic phases of the of bipolar disorder, however, are limited in time. Of course, narcissistic personality disorder is not. Furthermore, the mania is followed by, usually protracted, depressive episodes. The narcissist is also frequently dysphoric, but whereas the bipolar sinks into deep self-deprecation, self-devaluation, unbounded pessimism, all-pervasive guilt, and anhedonia, the narcissist, even when depressed, never forgoes his narcissism, his grandiosity, sense of entitlement, haughtiness, and lack of empathy. Narcissistic dysphorias are much shorter. They are, they are utterly reactive. They constitute a response to the grandiosity gap. In plain words, the narcissist is dejected when confronted with the abyss between his inflated self-image and grandiose fantasies and the drab reality of his life, his failures, lack of accomplishments, disintegrating personal relationships, and low status. Yet one dose of narcissistic supply is enough to elevate the narcissist from the depth of misery to the euphoric heights of mania. And it is not so with the bipolar. The source of her or his mood swings is assumed to be brain biochemistry, not the availability of narcissistic supply. Whereas the narcissist is full, in full control of his faculties, even when maximally agitated, the bipolar often feels that he or she lost control of his or her brain. And this is the flight of ideas. Uh, she feels that speech, attention span, 
um, are out of control, destructibility, and that motor functions are out of control. This is never the case with the narcissist. The bipolar is prone to reckless behaviors and to substance abuse only during the manic phase. The narcissist does drugs, drinks, gambles, shops on credit, indulges in unsafe sex or in other compulsive behaviors, both when he's elated and when he's deflated. As a rule, the bipolar's manic phase interferes with his or her social and occupational functioning. Many narcissists, in contrast, reach the highest ranks of their community, church, firm, or voluntary organizations. Many, uh, most of the time, they function flawlessly, though the inevitable blow-ups, the grating extortion of narcissistic supply, usually put an end to the narcissist's career and social liaisons. But still, most narcissists are high-functioning. The manic phase of bipolar sometimes requires hospitalization and, more frequently than admitted, involves psychotic features. Narcissists are never hospitalized, as the risk of self-harm is minute. Moreover, psychotic microepisodes in narcissism are decompensatory in nature and appear only under unendurable stress, for example, in intensive therapy. The, bipo the bipolar's mania provokes discomfort in both strangers and in the patients nearest and dearest. His constant sheer and compulsive insistence on interpersonal, sexual, and occupational or professional interactions, these engender unease and repulsion. His, her, uh, the bipolar's ability, ability of mood, uh, rapid shifts between uncontrollable rage and unnatural good spirits, it's downright intimidating. Something's wrong and creepy. The narcissist's gregariousness, by comparison, is calculated. It's cold, it's controlled, it's goal-oriented, the extraction of narcissistic supply. It's a bit psychopathic. The narcissist cycles of mood and effect are far less pronounced and a lot less rapid. Bipolar's cycle, narcissists rarely so. The bipolar's swollen self-esteem, overstated self-confidence, obvious grandiosity, and delusional fantasies are akin to the narcissist. They are the source of the diagnostic confusion, of course. Both types of patients purport to give advice, carry out an assignment, accomplish a mission, or embark on an enterprise for which they are uniquely unqualified and lack the talents, skills, knowledge, or experience required. But the bipolar's bombast is far more delusional than the narcissist. Ideas of reference, referential ideation, and magical thinking are common, and in this sense, the bipolar is closer to the schizotypal than to the narcissistic. There are other differentiating symptoms. Start with sleep disorders, notably acute insomnia. These are common in the manic phase of bipolar and uncommon in narcissism. So is manic speech, pressured, uninterruptible, loud, rapid, dramatic um, speech, including singing and humorous sides. Sometimes incomprehensible, um, sometimes incomprehensible, incoherent, chaotic, and it lasts for hours. It reflects the bipolar's inner turmoil and his and her inability to control her her racing, kaleidoscoping thoughts. As opposed to narcissists, bipolar in the manic phase are often distracted by the slightest stimuli, are unable to focus on relevant data or to maintain the thread of conversation. They are all over the place, simultaneously initiating numerous business ventures, joining myriad organizations, writing up thin letters, contacting hundreds of friends and perfect strangers, acting in a domineering, demanding and intrusive manner, totally disregarding the needs and emotions of the unfortunate recipients of their unwanted attentions. They rarely follow up on their projects. The transformation is so marked that the bipolar is often described by her closest as not himself, not herself. Indeed, some bipolars relocate, change name and appearance, and lose contact with their former lives. Antisocial or even criminal behavior is not uncommon, and aggression is marked, directed at both others in terms of assault and oneself in terms of suicide. Some bipolars describe an acuteness of the senses, akin to experiencing um, experiences recounted by drug users. They describe smells, sounds, and sights as accentuated and attain an unearthly quality of synesthesia. As opposed to narcissists, bipolars regret their misdeeds following the manifest. They try to atone for their actions. They realize and accept that something is wrong with them, and they seek help. During the depressive phase, they are egotistonic and their defenses are autoplastic. They blame themselves for their defeats, failures, and mishaps. Exactly the opposite is with narcissism. And finally, pathological narcissism is already discernible in early adolescence. The full-fledged bipolar disorder, including the manic phase, rarely occurs before the age of 20. The narcissist is consistent in his pathology, 
Not so. The bipolar. The onset of the manic episode is fast and furious and results in a conspicuous metamorphosis of the patient. Thank you for listening.